Medical Corridors, and I'm a planning specialist. So um, uh, nice to meet you all. Hey everyone, I'm Max Goldison. I'm the uh, Deputy Director of Housing Development at Ramsey County CED Department, and we'll be joined later in the uh, other part of the meeting today with Jared Gomez, our uh, Multifamily Development Specialist as well. So we put our um, program websites here so you can reference the materials as we're going along. Um, most of what we're going to be going over today is already on the website as part of, especially in critical corridors, part of our program guidelines. So really, this is our chance to kind of go through the guidelines in depth um, and answer any questions. Um, we will also be recording the webinar and, and posting it online, and we'll also post the slides online. So you'll have all of this information available. Um, so feel free to please put questions in the Q&A. Um, if you press that, you can ask questions. We'll respond to the critical quarters questions um, you know, at the end of that half of the presentation and then the emerging and diverse developers. Um, at the at the end of the hour. Um, and also all of the Q&A for each program will be compiled into an FAQ document um, that we'll also post on the program web pages so that um, you know everyone has access to all of those answers. Um, we quickly wanted to mention some of the other CED solicitations that are um, happening uh, soon. So the Environmental Response Fund will be opening next Friday. Uh, the deadline for that is November 1st, um, so that's for any environmental cleanup, environmental remediation needs. Um, and then we, our new program, the Site Assessment Grant, which we uh, formerly referred to as Earth Plus, you might have heard us mention that, that before, uh, that will be for early stage environmental assessment. Um, and that's a rolling application period and should be opening um, very shortly. Uh, probably in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then we have an information session. Uh, the Met Council is hosting one with a variety of brownfield funding um, partners. And so that will be there as well to talk about ERF and SAG. Um, so if you're interested, please feel free to attend. This will be in person on September 12th from 12 to 1.30 p.m. at the Oxborough Library in Bloomington. The link there will give you some more details on that event um, and also refer to those program web pages for more information. So we wanted to give a brief overview of um, the Housing and Redevelopment Authority levy, the HRA levy, because that is the funding source for the programs we're talking about today. So there's just a couple of things that are kind of unique about that. So it is the funding source for a couple of the programs listed here. Uh, the first year of HRA levy funded programs was last year. So this is just our second year of this funding source. And the eligibility, therefore, is limited to the HRA area of operation, which at this time is all of Ramsey County, with the exception of the city of North St. Paul. So unfortunately, projects in the city of North St. Paul are not eligible for these programs because um, they are funded by the HRA levy. Um, and you can find out more information about that at ramseycounty.us slash HRA. Um, another thing we just wanted to quickly note, and uh, feel free to ask questions about this, the Ramsey County Prevailing Wage Ordinance may apply to awards over $25,000 with construction labor hours. So that's just something to keep in mind as you're considering whether um, these programs are a good fit for your project. Great, so now we'll start talking about the Critical Corridors Development and Infrastructure Program. So just to ground us in the basis for this program and all of the programs that um, our department works on, the Ramsey County Economic Competitiveness and Inclusion Plan was published a few years ago, and that's really the guiding document of our department, as well as Workforce Solutions. And we wanted to connect uh, where this, uh, I'm going to go to the next slide. The um, you know the programs that we're talking about today directly come out of the strategies that were um, listed and outlined in that program. So the critical quarter development and infrastructure program specifically comes out of the strategy to foster inclusive economic development within kind of transit, economic and uh, cultural corridors. So. Um, to start off with talking about critical corridors, um, really broadly, we want to kind of ground these, this program or these programs in general in redevelopment. So these are really redevelopment programs um, that are that the primary goal is to support redevelopment projects. Um, and part of that 
redevelopment. So a lot of infill development um, since Ramsey County is almost completely uh, built out. Most projects in the county are infill. Um, and so the secondary goals of this program are through redevelopment to boost connectivity between transportation, housing, and jobs, to help create more compact walkable environments, to enhance pedestrian access and safety, and support vibrant business districts. And so there are three programs under this umbrella. Um, there's pre-development planning, commercial corridor initiative, and development infrastructure. Um, those first two, we held the solicitations for this past spring, and they will be held annually in the spring moving forward. So um, expect solicitations for those probably early next year. Um, and this fall, we'll just be talking about development infrastructure. So what are critical corridors? So those are major transportation, economic, and cultural corridors within the county. Uh, when we created these programs last year, we asked uh, the Ramsey County cities to um, provide feedback on, sorry about that, trying to just mute your speaker. Um, we um, asked cities to provide feedback on which corridors we would like to include. We started with our transit corridors, so areas that are served by um, buses and light rail and BRT, and then also added other significant um, corridors. So these are areas that serve as community hubs for housing, jobs, services, and amenities. They provide access to daily activities and destinations. And they also provide opportunities for wealth creation, economic inclusion, innovation, and transformation. So this map that you see a screenshot of, um, there's a link to this on our webpage, and all those green areas show the eligible areas for this program. So if you go to the Critical Corridors webpage, you can um, go to that map, type in the address, and see if you're within one of the green areas, and that shows the eligibility for this program. So um, broadly, the purpose of critical corridors development and in infrastructure is, again, to fund inclusive redevelopment and public infrastructure within these critical corridors. Uh, we're trying to support efficient land use and compact built form, and through that, enhance access to housing, jobs, and re retail services through proximity to transit, pedestrian, and bicycling infrastructure. And then I'll pass it over to Carmel to talk a little bit more about our eligibility. Yeah, and so eligible applicants for this uh, solicitation are developers, um, for-profit and non-profit, um, public agencies, and any related development authorities. And also um, maximum funding requests can be put in for up to $500,000. And uh, the timing for these activities will need to be completed by next year, uh, December 31st, 2025. Though activities can be completed prior to the grant award. and or grant awards for this um, will be showing kind of a timeline here in a couple slides, but it'll come in November. So um, those will be any time after November um, will be eligible for reimbursement. So. And so I'll go over a couple eligible activities here. Um, extraordinary costs of housing, commercial and mixed use redevelop redevelopment projects. And so, site preparation, uh, public realm improvements or amenities, stormwater management, geotechnical soil correction, adaptive reuse of buildings, building and related structure structures removal, uh, parking removal associated with redevelopment, and then also uh, public site infrastructure improvements that could be water, sewer, sidewalk, exterior public lights, and um, projects not associated with a development project are uh, must be comprehensive so it can't just be a single sidewalk or a street light and um, all of these eligible activities are in our program guidelines so if you need a list of that uh, you can go to ramseycounty.us slash critical corridors to be able to access that document and so yeah yeah and then i'll just um quickly the strategic property acquisition that's sort of a little bit of a unique category here so that is just for public agencies um, the intent of that is if there is a site that is in a really prime spot for redevelopment, for example, if it's next to a planned um, BRT stop or 
other kind of primary site and a city or another public agency wants to acquire that site so that to kind of preserve it for higher density redevelopment, um, acquisition is eligible in that case only, but for um, for-profit developers or nonprofit developers or other non-public entities, um, acquisition is not an eligible cost. Yeah, and I think I may have seen a hand raised. Um, we will be having questions later at the end of this presentation. Um, so sit tight, we'll get to you soon, but we'll keep going here. And so I just wanna list ineligible activities as well, kind of buildings construct building, construction, or renovation, environmental remediation, streetscaping or landscaping, tenant relocation costs, uh, tenant improvements, and then also soft costs, contingencies, and administration. And so some of the program priorities that we have for critical corridors are kind of alignment with the ECI economic competitiveness and inclusion plan um, that Ella spoke about earlier at the beginning of this webinar and also our equitable development framework. Uh, we'll be sending a copy of these slides, or not quite sending, but we'll be posting it on our website as well so that you can access that there. And uh, I'll keep going here, kind of an intensification of land use, emphasizing pedestrian environment and access to transit, increase in affordable housing, permanent jobs, um, increase in property tax base, the potential to catalyze surrounding redevelopment without displacement, um, improving pedestrian bicycle safety and access, environmental sustainability measures, and, and project feasibility and readiness, and kind of parity and funding between projects in St. Paul and the suburbs. Um, and I can talk just a, a few examples of our previous awards. So again, last year was the first round of funding for this program. So you can see more, a little more information about these projects are available on the website. Um, but these, this is a list of previous awards. Um, some of the activities that these projects included were things like site preparation, so grading, um, geotechnical soil corrections, um, some sort of exterior plaza and pedestrian improvements, pedestrian safety. Um, so just a couple of examples of, um, oh, and utilities. You know, one of them was the um, improvement of a water line to accommodate fire sprinkler systems. So um, those, you know, lines up with our eligible activities, but here's our, an example of some of the grantees that uh, were awarded on the last round. Okay, and so for the application process, um, the solicitation for critical corridors and for EDD, which we'll be talking about next, um, is through Zoom grants here. Uh, Pre-application meetings are highly encouraged because this is a new program, and so um, wanting to just make sure that we are kind of relaying out, um, we're hearing the ideas from folks of what they want to apply for, and then also it opened this past Tuesday, September 5th, and will be closing in four weeks on October 3rd. And award decisions will be coming in November, 2023. Uh, we'll be going through kind of just like what some of the application attachments in our Zoom grants application will look like. And so here's a little bit of a screenshot of how you'll see these all in our documents tab on Zoom grants. And yeah, and if you're interested in um, kind of a more thorough review of Zoom grants, we'll be doing that at the very end of the webinar after the EDD program um, information. So feel free to stay tuned if you kind of want to walk through what that system looks like. But especially for um, critical corridors, most of the information you'll need to fill out is under that documents tab. So as you're making an account and logging in, make sure you look there and download some of the information on that tab. Um, because that's really the, the primary place. Yep. And then we just wanted to quickly walk through some of those attachments um, as there's a couple things to look out for. Again, these instructions are all in Zoom grants as well, um, but we will ask everyone to fill out that application attachment part one. And then for part two, um, you'll choose either to do the redevelopment narrative questions or the acquisition narrative questions. So. I'm expecting the vast majority of interested applicants will be filling out that redevelopment narrative. Part 2B is only for public agencies looking to um, acquire property. So, um, you know, if that's you, you should probably definitely set up a pre-application meeting with us to discuss. Um, but ever, most people will probably be filling out 2A. 
Um, I think some of these others are pretty self-explanatory, but then the next page, just one other thing, or two other things I wanted to highlight. So um, a waste management plan, um, if, if your project includes building deconstruction or um, demolition, we ask that you uh, provide a waste management plan for the reuse of those materials. And then number two, a municipal resolution in support of the project. So that will be required for the disbursement of funds. Um, if you don't have it available at application, that's fine. Um, but uh, we provide a template in case you do want to get that um, in advance of award. You know, if it's a thing, especially for suburban cities, it can be pretty easy to just kind of get on the agenda and, and have that wrapped up. Um, but we can also wait until award to um, get that resolution. Another thing to keep in mind there, and again, feel free to reach out with us to us if you have questions about this, is if your project has gotten um, support through another city action. So if you've had some sort of plan approved, a variance, a conditional use permit, any of these things, anything that's been approved by the city council where your project is um, applying to this project, we can count that as municipal support. Um, so just, uh, again, that, that was a little bit of a tricky one, but feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, and I think that's pretty much all our information. Um, again, just a reminder of our application timeline for critical corridors. Um, if you, if there's any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll, uh, kind of stick around to answer them, um, either answer them verbally if you have any right now, please type them into the, the Q and A box um, and otherwise we will um, we can answer them by typing if we don't get a chance to uh, talk, talk to them over live. Um, and I think the next page also has our contact information so feel free to um, email us with additional questions. Um, I think I see someone has their hand raised but because this is a webinar we don't have the ability to um, unmute you, so please just put your questions in the Q&A box and we will um, do our best to answer those. So maybe we'll give a couple minutes to see if, or a minute or two. Okay, so I see one question came in. The critical quarters funds will not cover construction or rehab of property, but what if it's affordable housing? Um, so the critical quarters, it's intended to cover sort of costs outside the, um, the building itself. So it's not a gap financing source to just fund um, housing or whatever development overall, but if there are kind of uh, costs outside of the building, so if there are um, utility connections, all those things on our eligible activities list that might be a part of the overall project, those are some eligible costs. It's just the kind of renovation itself, especially interior renovation is not a helpful cost. Um, if you have kind of specific things in mind, feel free to set up time with us to discuss and we can kind of um, talk it over. Um, and we had another question, have new eligible corridors been added? Um, no, we have the same eligible corridors as um, last year. So uh, I think since the program was launched in July 2018, or August 2022, um, we have the same corridors. If there are other corridors that you think need to be added, you know, feel free to reach out to us and that could be, um, you know, a consideration for the next round. Uh, but for now, they're the same as the past rounds. So I think it looks like those are all of our questions for now. Um, we will, you know, if you if more questions come up about, about critical corridors, I'll stick around a little bit and can type them into the chat. Um, otherwise, we will move on to our next program and thank you for attending. And for the Emerging Diverse Developers, we will start at 12.30, so we'll have a little break here. Um, and then we'll start that at 12.30. Thank you.
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Emerging Diverse Developers uh, solicitation webinar. So um, we'll be going over a few housekeeping items first. Um, and um, we'll begin with introductions um, here, who's on the team. And um, we'll start, I'll start with myself, I'm Max Holgerson, the Deputy Director of Housing Development in Ramsey County CED. And I will pass it over to Carmel. Hi everyone, uh, Carmel San Juan, Planning Specialist at CED. And I'll pass it to Jerica. Hello everyone, Jerica Gomez, Multifamily Development Specialist here at CED. Um, for our first half an hour from noon to 1230, we went over the critical corridor solicitation. If you missed uh, that part of the webinar, we will be posting that online in the coming days here. And you can find out more information at ramseycounty.us slash critical corridors. Now, from 1230 to 1, we'll be going over our Emerging and Diverse Developers solicitation. And that's you can find more information there at ramseycounty.us slash edd. Um, again, this will be recorded. And uh, we'll be posting that online in the coming days. So um, we will be taking questions at the very end of the presentation. Um, we're set up as a webinar with panelists. So um, put your questions into the button that says Q&A. And um, you'll have to type them in because we can't call on you to speak in a uh, webinar format. So put your uh, type your questions into Q and A, and then we'll answer them live here. And then all questions that we receive during this, and any questions we receive over email um, during this uh, until September 12th, will be documented into an FAQ document, and we'll post that online as an addendum to the solicitation notice, so that everyone has the same access to all the questions that are asked. Um, yes, so we'll start there. I'm going to hand it over to Jerica Gomez, our multifamily development specialist, to go over the solicitation itself. Hi, and welcome, everybody. I'm so happy to discuss this solicitation with you. Um, as you may have heard, the solicitation has exclusivity for emerging and diverse developers. So we want to start this solicitation webinar with a what is a solicitation slide? A solicitation is a funding opportunity. They are documents that make the government's requirements clear so that businesses or individuals or entities can submit competitive applications. Municipalities generally acquire goods and services through this cost-effective, competitive, and fair process accessible to all businesses. A synonym for solicitation is request for proposals, or RFP, request for quotes, or RFQ, and a notice of funding opportunity. This specific solicitation, the Emerging and Diverse Developer Solicitation, opened on September 5th and will remain open for eight weeks. We'll close on October 31st at 4 p.m. Get your applications in on our Zoom Grants application. We'll talk more about what um, zero to five housing projects um, are required for Emerging and Diverse Developers. Um, and then we're going to tell you about the deferrable loan process. So it's a deferred loan for 20 years of affordability uh, for housing developments that are between 30 and 80 percent area median income, has 20 years of affordability. So that's tied into your loan. And then eligible in both St. Paul and suburban Ramsey County, except for North St. Paul, who does not participate in the Ramsey County HRA. Eligible activities underneath this funding opportunity are new construction, pre-development with site ownership, rehab, acquisition with some form of site control. And note, the prevailing wage ordinance may apply to all awards over 25,000. Now let's talk a little bit about the differences between site ownership, which is needed for pre-development costs, as opposed to site control. Site control for us in this development solicitation could be um, a letter of commitment, uh, a pending or tentative purchase agreement, a letter between you and the owner of the property, a contract for deed, um, and anything that declares that you will be purchasing this pro property, even if it has Ramsey County funding tied into it. So say your tentative agreement said, we are planning to purchase this bearing, Ramsey County gives us um, a, uh, a funding award um, in January of 2024. Now for pre-development costs, 
We are so excited to allow pre-development funding in this solicitation. It is also just a part of this solicitation, so you can apply with your same application. You do not need to create two project applications for the same project. Um, you can apply for pre-development if you have site ownership. Site ownership would be declared through a deed, through a purchase agreement that is executed, or if you have something specific that says that you own this site um, outright by 1031-2023. Now that is just for pre-development costs. So again, site control is available for all other funding activities. So new construction, rehab, and acquisition. Please let us know if you have further questions about pre-development funding. Next slide. Pre-development costs are architectural fees, engineering fees, consulting fees, environmental assessment fees, legal consulting fees, market analysis, administrative costs for loan commitment, zoning approvals or land use application fees, and permitting fees. These types of fees just need to be notated within your application and what the use of the pre-development funding would go towards as well as a cost analysis as to how much you believe would be needed. This pre-development funding with site ownership is available up to $20,000. Next slide, please. This is the evaluation schedule. So we're looking to evaluate applications uh, after close, of course. So we will be receiving all the applications by 1031 at 4 p.m. And then we will begin application review on 11-8. I'm telling you all of this because I want you to know what's going on in your applications in the interim. So between November 8th and December 12th, we will be evaluating applications and putting in board actions in order to tell you which projects were funded and which projects were not. We can begin our closing conversations as early as January 2024. I'm going to go. We're going to take our questions at the end of this uh, webinar presentation, so I'm not going to stop for questions right now. Next slide. Yes, please. Okay. Next slide. Here, I'm just trying to clarify to you that the Ramsey County EDD solicitation and program covered so many of the ECI plan strategies as well as Ramsey County's strategy or Ramsey County's goals. So one goal that Ramsey County has identified is to cultivate economic prosperity and invest in neighborhoods with concentrated financial poverty. And another goal is to enhance access to opportunity and mobility for all residents and business. For one, we preserve and increase the supply of rental housing units for lowest income residents. Remember, the EDD solicitation allows you to create housing solutions for those between 30 and 80 AMI and gives you points for creating housing for those who need it the most. Expand affordable home ownership opportunities and improve housing stabilities for communities that have experienced historic wealth extraction. One of the ways that the EDD is doing this is through um, the solicitation of applications for um, acquisition and sale. So you're able to purchase homes and sell them underneath the EDD solicitation. Uh, foster inclusive economic development within county transit, economic, and cultural corridors. If you were here for the critical corridors uh, solicitation announcement, then you heard that we are developing around critical corridors. Um, this is a important development um, goal for Ramsey County and so we are happy to be also helping to accomplish this goal through the EDD and support communities in equitable site development. One of the guiding principles, guiding documents for the Emerging and Diverse Developers program is the Equitable Development Framework. We're going to be looking at your narratives and your project descriptions and your livability questionnaire, which we'll talk about in just a moment, to identify if you have these same goals covered in those in those documents. So if you haven't, with your narrative, thought about how you are going to uh, scope your project, you might want to read the Equitable Development Framework, which we'll talk about a little bit later, as well as the Economic Competitiveness and Inclusion Plan. And then fostering economic competitiveness, innovation, and transformation. 
We are developing pathways to entrepreneurship in Black, Latinx, Asian, and Indigenous business ownership. We are supporting emerging and diverse developers with zero to five projects um, in the last 10 years in the state of Minnesota. And strengthening business retention and expansion infrastructure to support communities. And that is exactly what we're doing today. And I'm so excited to be a part of this plan. Next slide, please. All right. In our former evaluation of emerging developers applications, we noticed that they generally score extremely high in strategic alignment. We generally score our solicitations by strategic alignment or housing development solicitation specifically through strategic alignment, affordability, financial feasibility, and organizational capacity. In an effort to build capacity and support emerging developers, we increase the points allotted to strategic alignment because we realize that oftentimes emerging developers have the most innovative ideas and they score very high when it comes to our strategic alignment. So we want to be able, we want you to leverage what you already know in our strategic alignment because as our constituency, that are very important. Affordability, that's a quantitative analysis. And so we're going to be looking at affordability just a little bit later, financial feasibility and organizational capacity also. Next slide. Strategic alignment. We talked briefly about this, but 40 points um, is a high amount of points for, for the solicitation. And so thinking about what it is that you are also accomplishing that we want to accomplish through Ramsey County Strategic Goal, the ECI plan, as well as the equitable development framework will help you in the strategic analysis portion. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, one more, go back. We talked a little bit about the livability questions, but that's really how we score strategic alignment. So you want to make sure that your livability questionnaire, which is a required material for the EDD solicitation, your livability questionnaire connects with your project narrative as well as your project description. Um, and you want to make sure that you answer all of those questions fully. When I say 40% of the answer to strategic or 40% of your entire application score is for strategic alignment, I want you to take that very seriously. Next slide. Affordability. There were a few um, ambiguities around affordability, so I wanted to clarify them. Um, because we are allowing you to income average or income limit average um, for your units, we want to make sure that we further clarify. So all proposed housing developments must include units at or below 80% area median income. If you are not familiar with area median income, you want to make yourself familiar with what area median income is for the area in which you are developing. Um, so if you go online to, Max, can you help me here with this? Yeah. Uh, if you look up the Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minneapolis. Uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, AMI, it's actually an 11 county metro area that um, our uh, incomes are averaged across the entire region. And that's what sets uh, rental limits for our uh, our region and any other region in the country as well. I just couldn't remember where they go online at. Yeah. Oh, and um, they um, we will be posting a link of a table, um, an AMI table on our EDD website. Right now that's available on our ramseycounty.us slash first home website. That's an easy link there. Um, NeighborWorks has a nice chart. Metropolitan Council has a nice chart as well. You can Google those. I just wanted to make sure that I gave you the best information. So sometimes it's not me. Um, all proposed housing developments must include 80% area median income as an overall average of the rental limits when we get into that. Applicants, applications can only contain 30% AMI, 50% AMI, 60% AMI, 80% AMI, and 100% or market rate AMI units. Applications where rental limits average to 50% AMI will receive the most points, um, especially if they have units that are 30% AMI, even if they come with subsidy such as housing choice vouchers. Applications where rental limits are 60% AMI or below will also receive points. Income averaging allows applicant owners to elect to serve households with income up to 100% AMI or market rate. Depending on where your area is, that could be um, something that you would be interested in. Uh, looking at the equation to the right, we are teaching you how to do the AMI averaging across your units. This is a exemplary unit and it has 
or housing development and it has four units. And looking at these AMIs, we have 50, 30, another 50 and 80%. We divided that by the number of units, which is four, and we come to 52.5%. 52.5 is not under 50% AMI, it is under 60% AMI. This applicant would get the points for a 60% AMI or below um, housing development. Please post all of your questions in the question and answer section. Next slide. For financial feasibility, we are offering 25 points. And I want you to know that financial feasibility and affordability are a little bit different. When we're looking at financial feasibility, we're looking at risk. This is a risk benefits analysis that we at Ramsey County um, conduct. So we're looking at your total development costs. We're looking at the no number of units, and then we're looking at cost per unit. That's a little bit, that's a different measure than cost per square foot. So I want you to be aware of it. We're looking at the amount that you requested. We're looking at the amount per unit requested. And we're looking at the percentage of Ramsey County subsidy that you are going to need in order to make your project pencil or work. And we're also looking at the percentage of other funding that you've requested from other funders. So we want that to be reflected in your sources section in your multifamily workbook. Um, and we want your sources to equal your uses for the highest score um, in financial feasibility. Uh, your multifamily workbook is where we're going to get all of your quantitative analysis. So if you just put it in your narrative or just your project description, it may not be counted towards your points. So please make sure that your multifamily workbook is filled out um, as complete as you can get it filled out and that your sources equal your uses and your um, project does work financially. Please also be, how do I say this? You can use Ramsey County's funding that you're applying for as a source so that we can see that using this, that having this funding amount would make your project pencil. Highest points awarded for units that are $200,000 or less per unit. Next slide. Organizational capacity. We are looking at if the capacity of your team matches your project scope and your description. So we're gonna be looking at your description. We're gonna be looking at your team as to who you've hired in order to get this work done. Um, one of the ways that you can show your organizational capacity is you could provide a uh, the resumes for the individuals on your team. You could provide a analysis of what you what your scope of work is, as well as what persons on your team would be able to accomplish that work, or if you fill it out for that work and you have it listed as a construction cost or as a soft cost inside of your family workbook. Um, looking at the completeness of the team, you will get a max of 10 points for organizational capacity. Next slide. Now let's talk about what is required for the EDD solicitation. There are four pass fail documents that are required for the EDD solicitation. That is your eligible housing type which is not of the four, but it is that you have to have a acquisition, a new development, a rehabilitation, um, or pre-development costs associated with your application. Um, and then your multifamily workbook, which covers all your sources and uses, many uh, different quantitative metrics. And then your responses to that Ramsey County equitable development and livability questions. And remember, this is 40% of your overall score as well as an acknowledgement letter saying that your application is true and a lobby certification form saying that there is no one lobbying against your property at this point. Next slide. Here are some additional materials that, that you could put in your application and will be counted against your score if you do or do not have them. That is your project description, your development and financing team, your project schedule, your financial analysis or underwriting report, 
your applicant's financial statements, your detailed project budget, sources and uses, fund statement, commitment letters, architectural drawings, storm construction costs, bids and specifications if applicable, site improvement plans, scope of work, photos of project site, evidence of site control, the qualification forms of complete financial information um, for your service providers, operating expense projections, 15-year performance projections, market feasibility analysis, detailed housing unit breakdown, occupancy field projections, tenant data, zoning and land use documentation, resolution or letter of support, and support services, including a statement of whether your support service in the, your support service team is licensed or not. Next slide. Whew, that was a lot. I want you to know that 30% of your extra additional materials are all covered underneath a complete multifamily workbook. So that multifamily workbook is extremely important. And when we were developing the Emerging and Diverse Developers Program, one of the things that we were thinking about is building the capacity around being able to provide a multifamily workbook that was both, both useful and had more ease of use. So if you can get these things in on your multifamily workbook, then you'll have a competitive application because it is 30% of your additional materials already. Next slide. All right. We're already at Zoom Grant. Um, so we're going to stop sharing the PowerPoint now, and then I'm going to go on to Zoom Grants to show uh, participants what that looks like now. So we're going to fiddle with our computers for a second. We'll be right back. Hey, so I brought you over to my Chrome browser. And um, so for the Emerging Diverse Developer Solicitation, the best way to get there is I'm gonna go ramseycounty.us slash edd. That's our main webpage for us here. And then I'm gonna go down to funding opportunity. Um, within funding opportunity, I'm gonna press begin application. So uh, two things here that I want to point out. If you have an existing Zoom Grants application, you can now uh, log in there with, on the upper right corner of this webpage, email or password. So I'll show you that in a second. And if you're new to Zoom Grants, here's your free account right here on the right side where it says new Zoom Grants account. And you email, password, first name, last name. And that um, allows you to apply for Ramsey County specific open applications. You can see here in the center of the page, um, that there are two open programs. One is the Critical Corridors Development Infrastructure Solicitation, and the other is the Emerging and Diverse Developer Solicitation. So I'm gonna go ahead and log in. I already have an account with Zoom Grants with my Gmail account. So loading, logging that in. And then I'm going to, um, click on the Emerging and Diverse Developers uh, solicitation here. And I'm gonna make an application, so I'm gonna press apply. Okay. So um, there are five tabs across the top. I'm gonna hide them all for now so we can open them one at a time. And um, the first tab is shows the description of the solicitation. So this is language straight out of our uh, solicitation notice. And um, it tells you more about that, links you back to our EDD website where there's additional information. Um, then uh, there's the requirements tab. So it tells you more about those eligible housing types. Is it, uh, and these are pass fail. So you have to be one of these um, eligible housing types. Um, or it tells you the required materials and then the additional materials that Jericho went over in the presentation as well. Then we go to show funding. Um, we're gonna show funding criteria. Um, and then we're gonna show our digital library. So as you scroll down, you'll see that the funding criteria is the HRA levy that we spoke about earlier. Um, again, it shows that uh, maximum awards in the um, 
emerging and diverse developers for development dollars are 500,000 and the floor is $100,000. So all the requests will be between those two amounts. Um, and if you're uh, requesting pre-development dollars, that's up to $20,000 for pre-development funding. That is all laid out in the solicitation notice as well. So that document, which is available on the website is very key. Um, and then we kind of, we detail in more in depth the uh, different scoring uh, categories. You can always go back to this as you create your application and learn more about those as well. And then down in the digital library, you'll see the forms that you need to download and then fill out and then post back into your application. So um, you'll download them here in the digital library and then you'll upload them here in the documents tab. So we have the equitable development and mobility questionnaire that Jericho spoke about. That's called attachment A. Um, and then two forms, attachment B and attachment C are more kind of uh, just paperwork uh, that lets you know about the prevailing wage um, certification as well as um, an anti-lobbying form. Um, then you'll have the uh, Emerging and Diverse Developer Solicitation, so you can download a copy of that for yourself. And then the uh, most recent multifamily workbook, which is from the year 2022. So those will all be pieces that you will download and fill out and then repost to your application. So those are the required materials, attachment A, attachment B, attachment C, and the multifamily workbook. You'll not be able to submit your application unless all four of those are attached to your documents tab. So here I open the documents tab as if I was going to fill them up and you see that there is an upload button. And you can, um, once you're done filling those out, you can upload those there. Um, let's say I am to start my application as well. Um, so the first part of the Zoom grants is all the information that we went over today. And then you can see we have an eligibility determination. These are questions to make sure you have an eligible project. Then we have our application questions. And then uh, project address and contact, so let's know who we should contact once you submit. And then the documents. Once all of those are uh, completed, you may press um, submit now, and then we'll, um, we'll be able to uh, review after uh, October 31st. There is no fee. Uh, application fee, and there is uh, no application fee to join Zoom grants as well. So this is a free application. If you need to make, let's say you submit your application and you need to make additional edits, um, you should be able to do so even after submittal. If you are having issues with that, um, there's something called Zoom Grants University Online, and that has additional questions. And so uh, if you have questions that are like, I'm having trouble uploading a document, Zoom Grants University is where you'll go rather than Ramsey County staff. Uh, because most likely it's an issue with Zoom grants and not the application material itself. Uh, and then let's say you want to make an edit and you're having trouble after you submitted, you can always open up a new application and resubmit and just say, this is our latest, this is the final one. This is the updated one. We can see who submitted, so we'll have that kind of awareness as well. So those are options there. Um, I'm just going to... Um, So that is Zoom Grants. Um, again, I'll just go back to view open programs under Ramsey County, Critical Corridors, Emerging Developers. They're both under here. So once you log in, you should be able to see both. I'm gonna log out of my account here. I'm gonna stop sharing. And um, we will go back up to our um, PowerPoint presentation. And again, if you have any questions, we have about, we already have 13 questions we're going to answer here. Um, and then if we do not get to them all, they'll be posted in an, uh, we'll respond to them um, in an FAQ that will be posted online. Uh, we'll be accepting questions until September 12th. So the document will not be posted until after September 12th. But let's spend a little bit of time here answering questions. Um, I'm just going to dive in. Um, so Stephanie's question, if you open the Q&A, you can follow along. I'm going to answer these live. Um, do you need site ownership or site control for rehab? Um, site control. So it could be a tentative developer status granted by the city of St. Paul. It could be um, 
uh, a letter of intent and some of those other examples that Jerica uh, laid out in the uh, webinar. Again, the webinar will be posted online too, so you can always go back and listen. And uh, reading the solicitation notice as well clarifies many of these questions. Uh, new construction, again, that will be site control rather than site ownership. Is affordable housing preservation an eligible project for either critical corridors or emerging developers grant programs? I'll speak to the emerging developers part and then I'll let Carmel speak to the critical corridors piece. Yes, affordable housing preservation is an eligible project type. We're thinking about that both as rehab and acquisition. Let's say there is a four unit apartment building that does not have any affordable units in it at this moment. An application could apply for funding to purchase that and um, you maybe need to do a little bit of rehab to make sure those units are nice and ready for tenants as well. Um, and then we put the affordability declaration on there. Um, so that would be kind of a ho affordable housing preservation activity. So yes, affordable housing preservation is an eligible activity. Um, and then I'll speak to the critical corridors piece. So the intent of critical corridors is to really be about uh, redevelopment. And so, <laughs> excuse me. Um, uh, affordable housing preservation may potentially qualify, but it may also not be as strong or as competitive, depending, I guess, on how you um, uh, string the narrative surrounding um, more towards redevelopment really is the intent of that program. And so, yeah. Um, Ahmed's question, how will applications for affordable owner-occupant proposals be handled? Uh, we will be looking at the income of the folks moving in. Um, so they will need to be at 80% um, AMI or below um, for residents moving into those owner occupied units. Um, we will clarify this in our FAQ as well um, because this isn't really illuminated in our solicitation notice yet because we're really thinking about kind of the broadest use of these funds. Um, but we will also clarify and connect to our down payment assistance rules, which has a maximum purchase price of a owner occupied unit at 372,600. So we would not want to see any units for sale above 372,600. Um, and we will also clarify that um, we are not providing funding for the purchase of a home that then an owner occupied would live in. So let's say Ahmed is going to buy a home that he then lives in himself. The funding would not be for that, but for the development of new construction of owner occupied units is an acceptable use. Uh, for financial feasibility, do the sources of other funded funding need to be committed or can they be sources that have been requested? Requested is fine. They do not need to be committed yet. Sometimes people and developers need to use Ramsey County funding as first in to then go into the state application and that is fine. Maximum points will be given for a project at $200,000 per unit or less. Yes. Even if it is a studio or one bedroom. So yes, that, I'll uh, yeah, I'll, I'll hand that over to Jericho. Okay, so one of the reasons why um, this is 200K and even if it's a studio, it would still score highest. One of the reasons for that is because this is just one criteria. There are four criteria. Remember, there's strategic alignment, affordability, financial feasibility, and organizational capacity. So scoring the highest for affordability does not mean that you also score the highest for strategic alignment or that you score the highest for financial feasibility? Thank you for asking that question, Paige. Um, does the uh, development have to include affordability at 30% AMI? The answer is no, but they do receive, the applicant would receive more points as laid out in the solicitation notice if they do include a 30% AMI unit. Um, would EDD funds work for a single family home? Yes, a new construction of a single family home and then um, you cannot acquire a single family. So new construction of single family. Are, there, are you supposed to have your project site property already before applying to this? So let's say you're interested in acquiring a site. You need to demonstrate some form of site control. We will not be providing funds just for a general search for a property to acquire. So we wanna see um, some sort of site control, whether that's a letter of intent, uh, tentative purchase agreement, um, some of those, it's kind of a continuum of site control. Maybe you already own this site. So um, please look into the solicitation notice of that listed uh, uh, 
questions around site control. And if you have further questions, please feel free to email us and we will add that to the FAQ as well. Um, the multifamily workbook is a Minnesota housing um, document and we're just using the same one. So it's the Minnesota housing MHFA multifamily workbook. And we provided a copy within the um, Zoom grants and you can download that. If we hired a more exper experienced develop, uh, company as a consultant to our team, well, we'd still qualify under the American developer. Um, yes, because that would just be a part of your project team. And so that would show up as like uh, who on your organizational capacity, it would show up in your organizational capacity scoring about who's on your project team. And so we'd want a description in the additional materials about who's on your team. But yes, if you are still an emerging developer, you have zero to five projects, you would still qualify as an emerging diverse developer. Um, is the funding opportunity a grant or a loan? Um, so for the pre-development costs up to $20,000, that's a forgivable loan that then converts to a grant once the project starts. For development uh, costs, it's a 0% uh, deferred loan for 20 years. So um, it is a loan, zero interest, um, and deferred for 20 years. Libby Lodgson, I'm working with a client who qualifies as an EDD and will be applying to site assessment grants. What steps do you need to undertake to be approved for the EDD program to use the emerging developer status for that application? Is it a separate from the funding opportunity path that was discussed today? Um, so yes, site assessment grant and EDD are separate paths. Um, they have an uh, attestation form uh, for site assessment grants, the attestation form, which would list any properties and you'd have to sign and notarize confirming that um, is due at upon application for EDD. Um, it would be due at the time of award. Um, and so we basically, we have a question in the application that says, do you have zero to five projects? And then you'd be listing them there. Does the city or county have a list of properties that would be willing to, uh, they'd be willing to have developed? The county does not um, have any land available in this solicitation. Um, and um, there is, um, I can't speak for the cities in, if they have available land. So there's no land available through the county in this solicitation. So it's really up to the applicant um, if they already have a property in mind or if they already own a property. Um, can you recommend other sources of funding which are not Ramsey County solicitations? Um, I would definitely look into Minnesota housing, the local city that you're in, um, Greater Minnesota Housing Fund, uh, Metropolitan Council. There's a lot of different types of sources there. There'll be other Ramsey County solicitations in the future that are focused on uh, housing as well. So there's a 2024 spring solicitation as well. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking for other funding sources, um, government funding sources, um, there's a lot of exploration you can do in that area. We, we would probably recommend that you probably have private funding as well, right? Like how are you acquiring that building? It's probably through a mortgage, through a bank. Um, and that, you know, the sole source is not just Ramsey County funding. As you know, the the um, the maximum award is five hundred thousand dollars, and the minimum is one hundred thousand dollars. What can you get done within that award amount? Can an applicant partner with a site owner, and could that be considered a full site control? Yes, please just describe that um, that you are working with uh, a specific owner of a site, and a letter of intent could be drafted between the two parties. Uh, can funding be used to update the basement of multifamily into affordable housing? Um, that seems like, that yes, that would be a rehab, yes. Did you say that maximum purchase price of a single family home must be $372,000? Yes, so that is our Minnesota housing standard for um, our down payment assistance, as well as Ramsey County's down payment assistance. So three seventy two six hundred is the maximum purchase price for um, an owner-occupied unit. Um, Will cluster developments require each individual unit to have its own? Um, no, but that um, if it's all on one site, um, that can be one application. If it's a scattered site, that would be multiple applications. Can a developer have ownership of the property or are we expected to sell property upon completion? No, you can continue to have ownership and be the property manager and run that and uh, develop wealth as you see fit within that. Or if you believe that, hey, I'm gonna develop this affordable housing building and then sell it. Um, that's okay too. Just note that you will have a declaration of affordability on any property that receives Ramsey County awards. So to clarify, the developer doesn't need to be an approved emerging developer through Ramsey County to use the emerging developer status to be able to apply for the site. So, um, 
you will, so let's say you're applying to EDD, you will say that you have zero to five projects and you will uh, attest to that and you will do the same thing in the site assessment grant. There's not like, we're not gonna hand you a certificate that says you are an emerging developer, if that makes sense. Um, additionally, is it a requirement to use the technical assistance to be part of the EDD website or is that added bonus? That's an added bonus. And a lot of that capacity is already filled. There's already 25 people in a cohort, 15 people in a, um, small, group. small groups, and then 10 people doing advanced coaching. So um, some of those resources may become available um, later on, and you can always reach out to the technical assistance. But right now, a lot of that capacity is already taken up. So it is a bonus. Will there be another application period after this round in 2024? How long can grants 0% 20-year loan be held and used? Um, yeah, we're aiming for about 18 months where you, after you get an award, you have to use that uh, that award within about 18 months. Um, and in 2024, our next solicitation opportunity will be the larger um, 2024 housing development solicitation, which would open in February. Um, and um, after that, we we assume we're gonna have a, additional rounds of EDD into the future, but this is kind of the first one. So we have to wait and evaluate and see what happens after that. So um, there you are. For single family new construction to clarify, if we were to sell after completion, does it mean we can only sell it for 370 max? Are there other sale restrictions? Um, additional sale restrictions um, would include the income of the resident moving in. So it'd have to be at 80% AMI or below. And then um, yes, the sale max would be 372, 600. If sold within this year. Yeah. yeah, it may be updated that purchase price may increase annually, but over the last two years, it did not increase. So that's, you wouldn't want to plan for something that we can, we don't know yet. So yep, 372, 600 for sale. And then um, income restriction of the family that moves in. Mm -hmm. okay. So we are over time. Um, and um, these are really great questions. All of these will be uploaded into FAQ. Um, I downloaded them. Okay. We'll download the report of all the questions. We'll be updating that into a document. It'll be posted online. Um, all the other questions that we receive over email or through technical assistance partners will be uploaded on that as well. And everyone will have the same one. We'll be posting that after September 12th. So please uh, continue to work on your application, do your research, um, explore Zoom grants. And then on September 12th, you'll get further clarification of all of those. Uh, and I think one of the big things that we'll be focusing on in those FAQs is there seems to be a lot of questions on single family. So we'll be clarifying that as well. So uh, thank you so much for, uh, for attending both the Critical Corridor Solicitation and the Emerging Diverse Developer Solicitation. Again, this webinar will be posted. It is recorded. And uh, it'll be posted online in the coming days here. So uh, thank you so much for your questions and your attendance.